in the colonial period, it was called industrial art. It was for consumption, it was for mass production and distribution. So, uh, like all other products, I mean, whereas when it comes to cinema, we do not hesitate to call it uh, 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 cinema industry, right? We still do not want to call it. We still want to give us a very sac sacred position of non-commerciality uh, about finance, but that's only a pretension. That's not true, right? We are actually hiding behind that very puritanical sense of art for art's sake, you know. But I would say art for market sake. So that uh, uh, aspect of art comes to to the forefront with the uh, pop art. That the aspect of the market, marketability and the Abhanga of early modern period was more revolutionary and it stood forth in terms of its uh, uh, Abhanga progressive position rather than for products, making products for the market. It was against market, it was against the established values, it was trying to create its own market, it's like a new product you know, in the market. So it was it, it was uh, uh, accepted within the kind of uh, marketability in no time, in the, in the third decade of 20th century, it has already started, the gallery system has already started and people started collecting modern art and stuff like that. So, but still they are not treated or considered as uh, mechanical uh, objects for consumption. But with pop art, we come to the uh, our understanding completely. We come to the reality that art is just becoming a commodity uh, and nothing more than that. So the job of the dealers, uh, critic or the gallery uh, uh, was becoming like people in the market, you know, trying to sell the objects, what the artists are producing. So the job of uh, dealers, art dealers, galleries, or even art critics uh, uh, was basically to kind of promote this uh, product. So this is when, when, when we come to uh, experience commercialization of art. So now, what, what we are actually going to talk today uh, has a lot of bearing on this commercialization of the art. That is to say that uh, postmodern art to begin with had been ours, had been very centrally concerned about this uh, problem of art as an object, art as a, as a consumable object, art as a possessable object. So this is also the rationale of concept art, largely. That than any other installation, to performance, any other art. So something that artists do which cannot be reduced into commodity. Simply a kind of commodity in the gallery or in the museum, right? Uh, uh, so art also something that cannot be easily collectible by the uh, people who are, uh, had been in the habit of collecting art, you know, private collectors. Now, another point that is to be noted with the coming of uh, pop art is that state found it very convenient to promote this kind of art as, you know, kind of, uh, because it was very, very, very much like from the state's position, a very uh, uh, affirmative uh, language of the consumptive capitalist uh, market. You know, what Andy Warhol or uh, anybody did was a celebration of the, uh, that kind of brash um, capitalist uh, market orientation. Whether it was Oldenburg sculpture, like the burger or Coca-Cola or soup can or any of those uh, images was uh, so so in a way the artist's role was in tacit 
support to the art artist as if as as if it, it turned out that the artists were supporting the state and art was less and less becoming less critical of anything that the state was doing now one of the paramount importance of modern art is that it was subversive it was transgressive it challenged it was constantly challenging the establishment you now that is the answer that was uh, discussed in the last class about political aspect of art right so one position was that it should not be get appropriated by institutions that easily so it should live as more as an idea so whereas pop art was very easily appropriated by the state and uh, so it seemed to be giving uh, tacit uh, 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 support to the state and uh, uh, say in this especially 60s and 70s when uh, american um, capitalist uh, uh, arrogance had been coming in a very 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 in the world arena of course you have to also keep in mind the second world and the third world and the and the first world you know the the, the kind of div division that world had in relation to political affiliation at that time but america had this dream of taking over the world like the british had in the 18th 19th century so vietnam war all the wars after uh, america has waged anyway their intervention political intervention anywhere where had vested interest and artists pop artists didn't seem to have anything to say about that now this was very problematic right artists were uh, more uh, of a non mercenary nature uh the sorry the non mercenary nature of conceptual art that conceptual art could not be easily appropriated by the state in the sense of uh, an as as, a, as an assertive uh, celebrative thing of anything uh, of the capitalist market so uh, 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 conceptual art in the 60s and 70s seemed to have uh, kind of was corrective of the pop art's position of easily getting appropriated in the market by the way i must also mention in the beginning that uh, today's lecture is going to be slightly you know packed so be prepared for that because i'm starting from concept of art but i'll go to probably italian trans avant-garde would be my last uh, um, thing uh, that i want to kind of present today so now since pop art was not uh, kind of uh, uh, it was it was not possible for pop art to be activist in that in today's in 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 understanding there is a role that artist plays in the society in relation to politics as activists i mean that is an established fact that they stand by the progressive democratic secular um um whatever you may uh, so all that older notion of avant-garde has given way to something more uh, uh present you know confrontational in the sense of what uh, contemporary life is all about so addressing issues that are related whether it is feminist issues dalit issues uh any community issues any lgbtq issues etc etc so that is also the reason that artists began coming together for more ideological reasons rather than the earlier 20th century uh, uh coming together of artists in terms of movements like cubism or uh impressionism or there were more art style based movements but whereas today's collectives are more issue based more concerning activism in in certain sense so at least it began like that they they began organizing themselves into pressure groups uh, <coughs> so they tried to create a certain uh, context which is an aspect of conceptualism 
uh, as such in the 60s. Uh, so it, this, this was also to create a certain critical environment that you look at society or political power from a more, uh, uh, from a more critical point of view. So the first in that uh, uh, is Art Workers Coal uh, Coalition that was set up in 1969 in New York. Organized protests against war. America, you had a lot of protest movements in the 60s and 70s, including the hip hop movement or the you know hippie movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How revolutionary they they were, what kind of achievements they have made is another story to be uh, 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 thought about. But definitely, they opposed uh, major state uh, uh, you know engagements like uh, war. Uh, argued for rights like the feminists and the rights of the artists over how their art should be displayed and deployed in museum and gallery. So artists began to be having a say in, say, in curated shows or in museum shows and, uh, and it is now that beginning of this period that you have feminists becoming much more vocal about their uh, women's uh, position and role. So uh, critics like Lucy Lippard, artists like uh, Takis, um, Hans Hecke and Carl Andre, they, they're all kind of very vociferous, uh, politically conscious. Uh, uh, so in all this, you have a brief life of uh, Greenberg, the formalist Greenberg, whose ideas of purity and autonomy completely got negated in no time. So, uh, so you have women artists in revolution or war was for, formed out of this uh, Art Workers Coalition also in 1969. So this was also the first women art collective you can say. So this is actually the beginning of women, feminist practice, which is relevant for us always today, especially tomorrow going to be Women's Day. I don't know whether we have anything special for that, but I'm just pointing this out to you that, uh, you know, women, International Women's Association in, in the context of art or like uh, uh, war, Women Artists Revolution in Revolution began in 1969. Now, another place like Germany, you have an art collective called Flexus. That is where they have, uh, oh, it's a collective of artists, sculptors, installation artists, graphic artists, art theorists, pedagogues of art various uh, uh, people, many actually important artists of contemporary times have had their association with the uh, Flexus movement. Flexus uh, means only that, uh, uh, literally it means flux or flow, you know, constant change uh, is what is uh, the meaning of Fluxus. Uh, and it, it's an, and it's not just placed in one, that's also very important as a fact of uh, contemporary art, that a movement is not located in one place. It already starts with the uh, uh, 60s with pop art. As I said that pop art is international art. You know, it has its ramifications elsewhere also. But now artists began beginning their uh, you know, international net networking and this is also the time that you have curators beginning to emerge and kind of uh, traveling world over. And um, so uh, these art collectives also included composers and designers, uh, like in the case of earlier times, the, the Bajos movement. So, uh, so uh, uh, artists belong to different artistic media and disciplines comes together. Uh, so, uh, uh, there is also a very important usage of the term Neo Dada uh, or uh, noise music, uh, mechanical music. Uh, before our uh, 
um, you know, uh, uh, mm, mm, our computer art began actually in its, uh, so in Germany and all that, there is a lot of uh, uh, synthetic music in the sense, uh, mechanically produced music. Uh, so uh, as well as uh, 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 progressive visual art, as well as literature, uh, this also has ramifications in urban planning, architecture and design too. So German Flexus is not just limited to visual art alone. It has much larger canvas and it, uh, can, it, it was an association much larger. Now, so sometimes the uh, uh, Fluxus movement is also described as intermedia. Now, uh, quickly I would refer to our own Koj in India, uh, Open Circle and various other art collectives that were formed are based on this uh, kind of coming together that is uh, happening elsewhere. So uh, you can, you can uh, think that uh, new awareness come into existence uh, with the new forms of art. Uh, art can be now, we have substantial problem. Multiplicity is the, uh, 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 the, the mark of the contemporary art that there is no one particular uh, ism or the last ism that you find is poor po po part, you know, po possibly. Uh, but uh, 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 a, a substantial form could be art or a collection of idea could be art. You know, uh, uh, so conceptual art. Uh, so a single object or a large collection of object. You know, so multiple possibilities. It could be inside or the outside of the gallery. It could be on the wayside. It could be anywhere the artist wants. It could be in a mall or in a market. These are things that could never be imagined earlier on in the modernist uh, period. So there is a march forward as far as the, the art making is concerned. So the avant-garde notion, avant-garde as a kind of a very, you know, uh, 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 sense of progress, he is uh, somewhat uh, redundant, has become very redundant because it's not propagating one style over any other style. So you cannot talk about one style, you will talk about multiple styles as far as uh, postmodernism is concerned. So one of such uh, style or way of doing is process art or post-minimal art. That is also, it is called as post-minimal art because it is more properly called as process art. The process it is, uh, the object of art itself is not so important, but uh, is, it doesn't. It is not the focus of the uh, focus of the uh, uh, the thing about process art, but it refers to the process through which you form the art. So everything that goes behind a work of art, like archiving, collecting, gathering, sorting, uh, cat categorizing, collating. Uh, associating, patterning, colliding, moreover, all the actions that an artist does in relation to making something. And making something may not be a finality about that. So the process never ends in that, in certain cases. So, uh, so uh, a process like cooking, a process like, uh, you know, uh, uh, many other such per performative practices mm, could be brought under the category of uh, concept. All this will come under conceptual art, but it, because it is primarily based on concepts, concepts but uh, process, art, uh, process art is a separate uh, uh, branch because then you are actually, the, the, the onlooker is supposed to be seeing the process that goes behind making something. So how actions can be uh, defined as uh, actual work of art? You know, it may be just make, make process making, making, making the process. Uh, so it could be called as uh, process art. 
So process often uh, uh, entails the question of inherent motivation, what is the rationale of making something, and the intentionality of the artist is a matter of uh, concern. So uh, in process art, uh, uh, art is viewed as a creative journey uh, or process rather than as deliverable or end product. There is no end product as far as uh, conceptual art is concerned, uh, sorry, process art is concerned. Whereas concept art more proper is sometimes simply called conceptualism or concept art uh, is an art which is the, where the concept or concepts uh, or ideas uh, involved in the work take precedence over the traditional aesthetics and material concerns. So complete negation of objecthood is the principle of uh, concept art. That is an ultimate challenge to the object to that uh, pop art had entailed, right? All, uh, all, or all modern art had become to, come to, you know? So all art uh, that was reduced into becoming an object of exchange. Why problem with object is because there is a, uh, there is a, uh, absolutely uh, unacceptable kind of uh, uh, rock, uh, kind of uh, pricing, for instance, in the auctions, etc., etc., of the in the international market. Some masterpieces are millions of dollars, etc., etc. So, a kind of a very rational uh, market, you know, of the uniqueness based on the uniqueness of the object. Uh, the pricing actually the, the the market so the attempt here is actually to do away with the object as such there's nothing to collect so you uh, only uh, put across the idea it was in 1961 that uh, Henry Flint uh, coined the term concept art uh, in the Dada context it was called as anti-art or uh, found objects or collage or things like that, assemblage, it was called in the modern, modernist phase. But it is now that it, it has been named as conceptual art or concept art. Uh, sometimes conceptual art is also called as insta installation because installation basically uh, has to communicate an idea because installation is something that you install and dismantle. So the final product is not something consumable, something that one person can product or, uh, uh, possess or one institution can possess. Often it is uh, made of in ephemeral material in the sense as perish perishable material. Uh, <clears throat> now another very important aspect about concept art is that, that the very idea of the death of the author, Austin comes here. Artist is not a very uh, central figure in gesturing, like in the case of uh, um, uh, abstract expressionism or expressionism in general, where the artist is the paramount thing that you see in a work of art, right? But here, uh, it, it may be constructed by anybody. I just, an artist just needs to give a, sit, uh, give, give a set of written instructions. That artist can sit in any part of the world and uh, send the instructions in internet and then somebody here can sit and assemble them. So the concept of art rules out the entire oratic uh, persona of the artist. Uh, that is very interesting. So this is also how uh, Ma Marshall Duchamp's Fountain of 1917 has been interpreted. Like this uh, Sol Levitt's definition of uh, conceptual art. That is the first uh, to appear in the print I quote here, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, 
It means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and execution is a prefunctory uh, affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. So the, he is, uh, Sol Levitz is actually the person who has uh, written in uh, 1967 on um, conceptual art. So uh, here uh, Duchamp's relevance is pointed out and theoretical importance for the future conceptualists was later acknowledged by Joseph Kosuth, uh, the conceptual artist uh, of the uh, uh, 60s. In, the, in his 1969 essay, Joseph Kosuth's uh, uh, essay called Art After Philosophy uh, says that all art after Duchamp is conceptual in nature because art only exists conceptually. So now today in the classroom, if teacher, if teacher asks, what is the concept with which you are working on? It has a bearing upon this conceptualism. It's not that concept has to be a conceptual art. It, it, concepts are not just for making conceptual art, but concepts, it has come to be understood that a concept works behind even a, a regular object, a sculptural object or a painting object, painted object. You get my point. So the importance of concepts, understanding that art is more a concept, has extended itself to in the classrooms that the teachers can ask now that what is the idea behind you making something? What is the concept behind? I, I just simply use the word idea instead of concept for making everybody understand it. But concept, what is the kind of concept that you're concerned about? So, <clears throat> yeah, so Joseph Kosuth is one <clears throat> very important uh, theoretician as far as concept art is concerned. He, there is a rejection of formalism, uh, Clement Greenberg, uh, Greenberg's uh, formalism. Uh, and the commodification of art, or what is called as dematerialization, dematerialization of art. Concept art is also described as dematerialization of art, removing the need for objecthood altogether. So, if you want to argue now that uh, conceptual art, concept art is the most radical art movement of uh, post uh, modern most pod, post modern um, uh, uh, idea of art is now it is very important that we will also differentiate it with from the anti art position of uh, uh, marshall duchamp as we go ahead so, uh, uh, so it is, a, it is a breakaway from the aesthetic premise of Clement Greenberg. It is a subversion of, uh, it is also a subversion of gallery or museum as the location and determiner of art. Often it is actually in the object making uh, premise that you find a gallerist asking for this format to that format, small format work, etc., etc., or a medium particularly. Uh, uh, so, they, they, they are, they ask the determinants of the form and the size or the medium of the art uh, gallery or museum. <coughs> and the, 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 the art market as the owner and distributor of art is also challenged by the uh, <coughs> language. Now, written word becomes very important as well as the text, use of text is very important as far well as concept art is concerned. Um, so now, one of the major uh, points that to be kept in mind that it completely negates any importance of skill. Now, what do we do with all the skills that uh, art till now has cultivated through history? you have a fund of uh, skills, right? 
watercolor whether it's watercolor you know, casting whatever you may say print making whatever you you may say uh, so it jeopardizes the importance of the uh, history of skills but uh, it is also difficult to argue that there is no skill required for uh, concept concept art that is also there there is some kind of skill depending on what kind of object you are uh, resorting so one primary example which is uh, most of you will be knowing by now would be joseph kosut one and three chairs of 1965 i'm pointing out these dates because to know that Mm, uh, from early 60s simultaneous to pop art you have all these developments you know it's not just one movement that was happening it was not just minimalism that was happening and the, it was not just uh, uh, clement greenberg uh, argument that was happening but there was argument happening from all points of view so this particular uh, installation uh, called one and three chairs by joseph kozut has uh, a real uh, uh, chair placed there a photograph of that chair and the uh, the the concept of the chair what does this chair conceptually is this not this chair what is a chair conceptually is so the finally the uh, question is whether it is uh, the the chair as such which is uh, in the front that is a real or the image of the or the the chair this has also something to do with simulacra or the imitation or simulation but what the, the the argument here is that the definition is more real or the concept of the chair is more valid valuable as a communication what form of chair how it is uh, different from some other chair is less important than what what is the basic bare essential definition of a chair how do you define a chair like any other object right how do you define a table how do you define a computer for instance so the definition becomes more real um, so without definition without the concept one would never know what an actual chair is so we have no way to communicate anything without the concept so uh, so he uh, says that um, uh, i used common functional objects such as a chair and to the left of the object it's a full description of what he has done um, uh, he further actually goes into saying that uh, by changing the location the object the photograph and still have it remain the same work was very interesting it were, it meant you could have an artwork which was that idea of that artwork and its formal components were in important now i am actually not uh, speaking for uh, conceptual art i'm just presenting to you that movement that very uh, very important movement of conceptual art or concept art now art actually faced art making has faced this challenge of uh, permanence and sacrosanct value of the material oil painting bronze sculpture or marble sculpture these are the kind of modernist or the pre modern uh, values that are so important you know for uh, for art right so that is also the reason that you uh, talk about material as a very important uh, value in the in the art making so uh, conceptual art uh, uh, challenged the entire materiality of the art and said that an extreme position of idea is the art has come but there is actually a another group of the another movement or a group that was uh, based in Ita italy radical italian art movement called art povera art was called as art of poverty now it was not because they were could not afford uh, 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 precious material valuable material or uh, pricey material but artists here explored a range of unconventional processes and non traditional 
everyday material so if you uh, 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 think that today we have a flood of materials what material you cannot use you say it could be hair it could be body parts it could be plaster cast it could be anything that could be called uh, art so this uh, shift over in the concern of material from something very sacrosanct like uh, uh, material uh, to more ordinary uh, ephemeral materials like newspaper to uh, thread or uh, hair or uh, anything that is available uh, becomes uh, so uh, as I said that the poor here in this title of the movement refers to the wide range of materials, uh, cheap materials that they uh, so uh, used uh, instead of oil paint, canvas, uh, bronze or carved marble. Materials used by the artists included so uh, soil, rags or twigs or anything. In using such uh, throwaway material, they aim to challenge and disrupt the value of the commercialized contemporary because a lot of art, value of the art was on the basis of the material in which it was made. Like a bronze sculpture or an oil painting, uh, a watercolor painting, each actually was prized and valued on the basis of the material that it was. Uh, so here, there is a complete challenge of that. Uh, there are some examples of these uh, here by Janice uh, Cornelis, and these are two examples of um, uh, well, so using wood and wool or some kind of rope. Uh, uh, in, the, in the making of art. Now, an extension of this is uh, found in earth art or uh, earthworks. This was coined by an artist called Robert Smithson. Now, this is the sculpture as an extended field. We are actually talking about sculpture, three dimensional objects, uh, a sculpture as an extended field, which is a postmodern phenomena that you are no more actually making uh, simple objects to be standing on a pedestal or in a public uh, space or in an open space, but we, you are actually transforming the landscape, landscape itself into a work of art. So it was uh, 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 that kind of uh, uh, extended field of, as I said, of sculpture. Uh, and also painting. If you use paint in the in the earth on the on the uh, space, but uh, practice is not defined in terms of one medium. There is no stipulation about one medium. Uh, it is also art form that is created within nature through appropriation of nature. Maybe twigs, maybe branches of trees, broken uh, something, something, you know or uh, corroded anything uh, so uh, 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 so rock soil um, boulders organic media like logs branches leaves and water very importantly we introduce materials such as co uh, concrete metal and mineral pigments also are used in this um, you know wide ranging Mm, you know, use of uh, materials. Sculptures are not placed in landscape, rather the landscape is the means of their creation. Landscape, in the landscape, landscape itself is transformed into uh, a, 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 a work. Like this particular example is the most primary example of uh, land art by Robert Smith, uh, Smithson. It was created in 1970. Uh, please take note of this uh, dates. It's very important for you to remember. So if somebody doing it today, so it will be after how many years? 30 years, 40 years. So already the ideas are already there in, in the air. So Spiral Jetty uh, in the mid-April 2005. This is a photograph of that 2005 photograph. It was created in 1970 and still exists through 
although it has often been submerged in the so it goes it, 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 it the visibility of it depends on the lake in which it was uh, created so you can uh, uh, you you have if you have to see the uh, artwork you are not depending on the museum curator but you are depending on the nature <laughs> right if the water recedes you can see the work of art it consists of some 6500 tons of basalt earth and salt in the making of this uh, huge uh, uh, so land art is to be understood as an artistic protest against the perceived artificiality, plastic aesthetics, and ruthless commercialization of art at the end of 1960s in America. So I have already pointed out to you that these movements, these, these uh, uh, shift overs from pop art is basically kind of breaking away from the objecthood of art making. But some artists choose object making in totally different, very radically different format. So some artist has gone into the concept art, some artists kind of gone into uh, earth art. Now, we would also focus more, a uh, little more on uh, Fluxus movement and uh, the contribution of very important artists called, whose name is Joseph Boyce. He is a very paramount, he's one of the most important artists of the second half of 20th century, I would say. Uh, like as big or more important than, say, Picasso, uh, as far as art history is concerned. So, uh, Flex's more, more, uh, movement was very socially and politically conscious and it developed its anti-art and anti-commercial aesthetics under the leadership of George uh, Macunas. Flexus as a movement a series organized series of festivals in Paris, in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, London, and New York with avant-garde uh, performances often spilling out into the street. Uh, so uh, performance art was very uh, useful because it, it challenged or it broke with the the kind of object hood of the art. Most experimental artists of the Fluxus movement are Joseph Boyce, Yoko Ono, Namjoon Pike. These are very important uh, three artists from three parts of the globe. Very importantly, Yoko Ono um, uh, uh, and Namjoon Pike are from uh, Japan. So they played, uh, uh, the, this, this movement actually continues and has not died, and played an important role in opening up uh, definition of what art can be, uh, definition of art. Uh, uh, this is a small portrait. I couldn't avoid not keeping a portrait of this, although I'm not so fond of, uh, I'm not favorably disposed of monograph, monographic thinking about art. Uh, but Joseph Baez is so, so important. His contributions are so, so phenomenal that I decided I'll keep one picture of him as a mark of respect to this great personality. He lived between 1921 and 1986, one of the most influential art, art, artists of uh, second half of 20th century. Yes. His work is grounded in concepts of humanism. Now, yesterday, somebody was asking about humanism. So there is a retake on humanism here. Social philosophy and what he called as anthroposophy. It's a philosophical uh, idea, anthroposophy, that postulates the existence of an objective, intellectually comprehensible spiritual world, accessible to direct experience through inner development. Now, if you understand, what we understand spiritual is absolutely opposite to the physical, right? According to this uh, uh, philosophy, anthroposophy is that it is an intellectually comprehensible spiritual world accessible to direct experience. You know, it's something tangible, something uh, uh, through the personality development. So it is not something, spirituality is not something so, you know, vague as it is understood. But it's about human experience and, and human transformation. 
so it 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 moves on basically based on these ideas he travels forward and extend he comes to his extended definition of art an idea of social sculpture he puts across the idea of social sculpture as a total work of art he defines it as total work of art ideal work of art universal artwork synthesis of the arts comprehensive artwork these are the various ways he defines all embracing art form or total artwork these are various terminologies that he uses to define social sculpture social sculpture is one formulation that we will come to uh, what he actually meant by social uh, work of art uh so uh, uh, uh so so uh, he is actually not averse to any particular form of art so to say but he puts forward his idea of social sculpture uh, uh which can make use of anything that is available in terms of uh, art material in terms of uh, so unlike uh, the other uh earlier of conceptual art now i won't actually read up this whole uh, quotation by it's about boy's life i will just uh, narrate his a uh, little bit about his background that he is an untrained uh, uh, artist he doesn't come from an artist background uh, in terms of training but he was a uh, 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 soldier in the second world war part of germany and he was wounded and fell in the area of tatars this um, tribal the, the 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 nomads of uh, crimea one uh, land between russia and german fronts you know it was a kind of a no man's land uh, it is said like that so uh, he was unconscious and he was uh, taken by the tatars and then treated by their traditional medicine he was put in uh, felt and um, mm, uh, this um, mm, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. fat 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 yeah so he he was unconscious and by the time he got back his consciousness uh uh he says that i remember voices saying voda that is water and then he felt of their tense and the dense uh, pungent smell of cheese fat and milk they covered my body in felt and to help it rejuvenate warmth and wrapped it in felt as a insulator to keep uh, warmth in so he he revived he revived so this was a kind of a rebirth for him and so it is after that that he has this was the great learning that he had about non european um systems like alchemy and black magic and uh, all kinds of traditional practices you know of uh, mm, of cultures that are outside uh, so uh, so that is the beginning and then he goes into kind of making fantastic very original kind of uh, thinker and working uh, his works can be broadly divided into four domains work of art in a traditional sense that he does with uh, paintings drawings sculpture and installation that he does he does performances he contributes to theory of art as a he was an academic he was a teacher uh, then he was involved in teaching and social and political activities too so he was a uh, what do you call all encompassing personality you can say he was not just doing art but he was also concerned about society culture uh, human life war political systems i mean there's hardly anything that he has not thought about traditional medicine you know the the modern so 
so uh, so uh, often it is said that boys is uh, imitator of uh, a follower of dadaism so he's called a neo dada etc etc now this may be true to a certain extent like we saw in the case of uh, uh, conceptual artists also we saw that that connection dushan definitely is a very very important modern artist definitely uh to have influenced the postmodern art you know artist but then to say that anybody was imitating uh, uh marshal dushan would be a misunderstanding so that is why boy's relationship to dushan and the ready made is central aspect of difference in his practice he has a critique of uh, dushan i mean if you can do a critique after you imbibe it right you understand it so he has imbibed uh, um, dushan he appreciates that he says very important quote is that the silence of marshal dushan is overrated it's a, to me it is a very important quote that is to say that marshal dushan left art making because of his anti art position after making his statement it was not possible for him to go ahead in making art he made the ultimate uh, uh, statement through his art installations right and then he went into a kind of a, a kind of a pleasurable hedonistic if you want to say conceptual uh, engagement of chess playing with a uh, nude lady i mean this is a very famous photograph that you get to see that so he was um, uh, so this is what he calls as the silence after negating you come to a silence you know and uh, and uh, 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 joseph boy says that marshal duzam's silence is overrated true because by if you just kind of take it out and try to kind of uh, put it in any other context it becomes imitation and you can't actually repeat dadaism because it happens only once it can only be happening once once it has been stated it has been done with you cannot actually go beyond that so fluxus on the other hand was directly inspired by the radical dada approach and was into reinventing art this is very important fluxus was more positive in its orientation in that you can still do positive things in with, with art so that actually gives us some hope for life so otherwise dada we is that we appreciate we discuss dada in a very historical way as a most significant movement etc etc but if it becomes a dead end then it is negative there's no life after that it's suicidal whereas it is um, uh, uh, marshal dusham sorry it is uh, uh, joseph bias and many others who have also in a certain way the uh, pop artists have reinvented art in a certain way but of course the approach of uh, 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 joseph bias is much more now uh, now i am quickly kind of moving uh, to explain some of his um, performances it's a 1965 performance called how to explain pictures to a dead dead hare dead uh, you know this uh, bunny right uh, so here he uses metaphors i mean they are not descriptive kind of titles the artist uh, could be viewed through the glass of the gallery window his face was covered in honey and gold leaf uh, an iron slab was attached to his boot uh, his arms he cradled a dead hare a dead bunny into into whose ear he mumbled muffled noises as well as explanations of the drawings that were lined up on the wall he was actually telling the dead animal so farcical so nonsensical you know it could become so 
it's is very very his some of his early works are very curious and uh, very anarchic i would use that word honey is the product of bees and for joseph boyes uh, bees represented an ideal society of warmth and brotherhood or communal communal uh, you know community working and gathering gold had its importance with the alchemical um, alchemy and iron the metal of mars you know this is where red mars stood for a masculine principle of strength and connection to the earth now whatever you may make out of it i am not very sure about that uh, uh so i keep it open for you to think about it don't ask me uh, please give me the final um, meaning of that you know often it is not possible to interpret those some later works by uh, joseph bias you can at least guess what it, it could mean in a more uh, uh, joseph bias uh, produced many such spectacular ritualistic performances and he developed a compelling persona whereby he took on a liminal shamanistic role so he defined artist's role in the society as a shaman as a as a just as a magician who has the capability of recreating life or infusing life into dead things so uh, 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 so he enable a passage between different physical and uh, spiritual states now this is a very famous ba- work uh, famous performance by him called i love Am- i love america and america li- la- likes me i like america and america likes me now uh, now this is a very curious uh, 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 performance uh, of 1974 this was done in 19 in uh, he was uh, flown f- uh from germany to america new york and from the airport he was taken in an ambulance to the site of performance although that was predetermined and he it, he was taken to a gallery uh, uh uh he he was in the ambulance covered with this felt and and the room that he was set himself in was a room uh that was uh, 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 a coyote a wild wolf you know was uh, made to kind of uh, roam free in that uh, uh, room and it took for year, uh, eight hours over three days that he lived in that uh, closed room At times he stood wrapped in a thick grey blanket of felt leaning on a large shepherd's uh, staff at times he lay lay on the straw at times he watched the coyote as the coyote watched him and cautiously circled the man he shredded the blanket to pieces that the the coyote shredded the blanket to pieces and at times he engaged in symbolic gestures such as striking a large triangle or tossing his leather uh, gloves into the animal the performance continuously shifted between elements that were required by the realities of the situation the elements that had purely symbolic character at the end of the 3 days boys hugged the coyote that had grown quite tolerant to him by now <laughs> and was taken to the airport again he rode in a wheeled ambulance leaving america without having to set foot on its ground now i mean what weirdness that is uh, going all the way from germany to usa and not touching the on the ground he was uh, doing this pr- does this mean that he was representing america through the coyote uh so he later explained in certain way i wanted to isolate myself insulate myself see nothing of america other than the coyote so coyote was actually the kind of wild america that he was kind of configuring now it is understood in 1974 the notorious political 
capitalist regime. I suppose it was Reagan's time. Uh, it was a political statement, but not a kind of sloganeering. So how politics work in this kind of thing is very important. Uh, to It's very exemplary. Now, it is after that uh, that you, you can talk about his concept of social sculpture. Uh, after 1960s, uh, Joseph Byers formulated his central theoretical concepts concerning the social, cultural and political function of potential of art and potential of art. Art as having its, 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 its role in the society. Boyes was motivated by a belief in power of universal human creativity and was confident in the potential for art to bring about revolutionary change. So he is somebody who was not ready to kind of, uh, this is what he actually meant by the silence of uh, 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 our Marshal Duchamp. So he was not ready to kind of forego art, the human faculty of creativity. He holds uh, highest. So, uh, so he believed that art can bring revolutionary change in the society. Uh, Boy's formulation is in which society as a whole was to be regarded as one great work of art, to which that is the definition of social art, social sculpture, what he means by social sculpture, uh, 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 to which each person can contribute creatively. And it is here that uh, there is a famous uh, um, quotation that he makes, a borrowing that he makes from Novelis, uh, that everyone is an artist, quote unquote, everyone is an artist. Now he puts it in, in his context, uh, I will read out that quote uh, next, in the next page. Voice elaborates these principles of freedom, democracy, and socialism, saying that each of them depends on the other two in order to be meaningful. Now, in 1973, Joseph Boyes uh, wrote a very significant quote I am going to read out here. Uh, Only on condition of a radical widening of definitions will it be possible for art and activities related to art to provide evidence that art is now the only revolutionary, evolutionary, revolutionary power. So he gives that kind of importance for art that that is the only one way to kind of survive. Only art is capable of dismantling the repressive effects of senile social system that continues to totter along with the death line. To dismantle in order to build a social organism as a work of art. So his definition of social sculpture. Every So it is in this context that he quotes novelists and says, every human being is an artist. I put it in capital letters, a social organism as a work of art. So he imagines everybody participating in the making of the work of art in some way or the other who for, from his state of freedom, the position of freedom that he experiences at first hand, learns to determine the other positions of the art, the total artwork of the future social order, what he calls as the total work, total artwork of the, uh, so, uh, so, so this is a very significant, uh, uh, so one of his most, much quoted work, that he did was in 1982 as part of the document as seven in the um, uh, he planted 700 oak trees, oak trees at Kassel in Germany uh, this project uh, uh, was exemplified the idea that a social sculpture was defined as an interdisciplinary and participatory so these are very important definitions interdisciplinary that doesn't involve just one discipline, but multiple disciplines coming together. And it is also social participation that makes work of art. Boyers wanted to effect environmental and social change through this project. Now he first actually uh, made a pile of stones that was uh, in the form of a large arrow. Uh, 
uh, a pile of uh, basalt stone and uh, uh, that was that arrow was pointing towards the a particular tree oak tree and he made a condition that anybody can remove any part of this um, uh, arrow only if 7000 oak trees are planted imagine the kind of uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, um, self determination and arrogance of the uh, thank you uh, of the artists you know he made an arrow in stone to pointing no thank you uh, uh, towards the tree and made a condition that you have to plant 7,000 trees, oak trees, then only you can remove that arrow from there. Arrow that was directing towards the oak tree. You got my point? Right, so, so uh, his uh, ulterior motive or the purpose was to affect uh, environment and social change through this project. Now, he said about this project that my point with these 7,000 trees was that each would be a monument consisting of a living part, that is a tree, the living tree, the live tree, that consciousness that you are installing a tree as a, as a sculpture, uh, changing all the time, and the crystalline mass of the stone, maintaining its shape, size, and weight, this stone can be transformed only by taking from it. You have to chip it off to change this. So the contrast between an organic tree and a, and a stone. Um, so then the piece splinters off, say, never by growing. So it moves, it, it, the process, he's actually su suggesting to the process, to the, um, to the organic world as well as the, you know, uh, to the to the two two different methods of the organic world by placing these two objects side by side the proportionality of the mon monuments two parts will be the same so the role they play to with each other is the same that is a statement that he is uh, uh, said the display of a tree with a solid stone at the first glance you could it was an enigma it was not uh, uh, obvious by itself, right? It generates questions and full of wonders that consecutively led to additional questions. What is the eccentric juxtaposition of the gray so, uh, with the green leaf tree trying to, what, what, what does it actually communicate is the uh, uh, question that. Um, so it uh, 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 kind of encouraged uh, challenged, uh, it encouraged and challenged the established, uh, established assumptions, all assumptions associated with tree. We take it for granted, you know, a tree. What is there? It's a tree. So, but he is actually pointing his finger at the tree and saying, this is a growing thing. This is like a sculpture. It should be noted, however, that uh, it, uh, that, that, uh, however, that it is not merely a denial against the conventional perceptions, but rather a decisive new attitude. He comes with a new attitude as far as um, art making is concerned. The solid stone that stands beside the ever-changing tree is a symbolic representation that brings out this message. Uh, those, uh, these two natural and personal qualities of the, of the material that he uses, the stone and the, st the tree, are complementary and coexisting harmony. That's the kind of harmony of nature that he sees. As a symbol of regeneration, a slow, progressive growing oak tree represents a continuous transformation of life, society, and the entire ecological system. You know, it takes years together for a tree to grow. It's a slow, very slow process, right? So, so, so another quote that interests uh, us is, I am not, I'm, I'm not only want to stimulate people, my purpose is not stimulating people, but I want to provoke them, you know? Provoking is a kind of a method that uh, Joseph Bias uh, 
amongst other things boys co-founded political organizations german students party he was part of students movement in 1967 organization for direct democracy through referendum 1971 free international university for creativity and interdisciplinary research in 1974 and german green party <coughs> in 1980 so he was not only making art making a difference in art making he was also involved in political so if there is a contemporary uh, icon for activism art and activism it would be definitely uh, joseph bias who would be a pioneer in that he was a vocal um, uh, oppo oppo opponent of nuclear weapons and campaigned Uh, strenuously for environmental causes indeed he was elected the green party candidate for european parliament also uh, because it's <coughs> so he was of course political uh, there is a song and music video sun instead of regan by him called uh, 19 in 1982 manifest a the theme of regeneration optimism growth and hope which are uh, important that runs through his life and work as well as the interest in contemporary nuclear politics quote here but we want sun instead of regan to live without weapons uh, whether west whether east let missiles rust that is a slogan <laughs> Now you said no. Sloganeering is not art. This sloganeering is art, definitely. I would stand by that kind of sloganeering. So um, I said that a lot of uh, modern art or contemporary art is not about sloganeering, but in certain cases, definitely, that you can, you don't make a differentiation. So what if you are sloganeering? You need to shout slogans sometimes, you know, at times, and you should do that. Is a kind of a statement. Here we have two pictures of this uh, his uh, installation, uh, what he called as the social sculpture of uh, oak trees that were planted between 1982 and 1987, seventy thousand uh, seven sorry seven thousand oak trees in Documenta. I think I'm on time. Uh, I'm glad actually that uh, we have covered a whole range of areas with regard to anti-obsect. That is the theme of today, right? We are talking about artists' concern about anti-obsect, not wanting to create objects that can be exchanged, prized, sold in the market, you know, auctioned. And aura can be created around the artist. So, but having said that, you should not throw some. According to some uh, art thinkers, you should not throw the baby with the water. <laughs> Whatever we have as tradition in, in painting or sculpture, we should be able to preserve and you know value them. Not in terms of their museum value. not in terms of because they are history and so we have to preserve them but definitely in terms of our possibility for expression possibility so in that regard german expressionists are very valid very important kiefer and others i'm i'm not going into their contribution i'm also not going to into the contribution of uh, new figuration as an uh, offshoot of the british pop art like i mentioned artists like david hockney and kitai for instance so there was a large scale movement of neo figuration springing from uh, pop art the idea of pop that was but definitely a reinvention of figure and narration now if you want to see a connection between pop art and figuration narration particularly in 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 england and then in india with baroda 
you know uh, you can make a definite connection there of uh, wanting to liberate from the puritanical notion of uh, abstraction and coming to a kind of a possibility for narrating the history narrating the context narrating the local you know uh, not just to the subject namely the artist in the case of, as in the case of uh, abstract uh, sorry ab expressionism but also artist who is looking at history and life in general so figuration comes back despite the fact that modernism had rejected it narration comes back in a big way with kitai and uh, david hockney and anna bash the acceptance of figuration so these two things i am actually not uh, covering in that uh, detail but you need to kind of keep them in perspective when we are thinking about uh, contemporary art or postmodern art but i am directly going into italian trans avangard because it also concerns us somewhat like the uh, the european neo figuration uh, concerns us because of baroda experience you know uh, uh, trans avangard italian concerns us because we have our own artists like rimsen or uh, surendran nair you know have definitely been influenced and inspired by yeah. and many more i am not just limiting so it is a very influential movement that we are going to uh, understand uh, the trans avangard italian or it is called as neo expressionism why is it called trans avangard i will explain it as we go ahead uh, it embraced a wide range of poetical mythological even grotesque figurative imagery including realistic and imaginary portraits uh, in its representation inspiration came from the early 20th century futurist movement metaphysical pain see one argument that is put forward is that from the history of modern art in italy where futurism happened italian futurism if you know early 20th century you have also at the same time the metaphysical painting of de chirico you have also symbolism and surrealism there but you have also uh, italian uh, uh, painter hmm? uh, that uh, i forget uh, the name de chirico and uh, i'm forgetting the name of the artist i'm so sorry Uh, so there are metaphysical artists that came along with uh, that at the simultaneously as uh, Italian futurists. So uh, that uh, one of the argument is that art movement should not be based on the styles. That you shouldn't be just be talking about Italian futurism only or German expressionism as a uh, thing, but you should be thinking that art styles are varied. at a given time like if you look at the works of sandrocchia who was born in 1946 francesco clemente who has a most uh, uh, greater connection with india because he keeps traveling to south india particularly he was also in kerala he he keeps himself very anonymous he doesn't declare himself and so and so but uh, he appropriates he uses indian craftsmen in making art uh cookie is another enzo cookie dicola di meria and uh, mimi mimo paladino these are all artists who are put under this loose category called trans avangard it was not even a kind of a collective in that sense that we understand collectives today it was uh, a term coins co coined by actually bonito olivia an italian theorist uh, it was he was an italian art critic so that why it is uh, trans avangard did not appear till 1980s it's also not a very uh, 60s 70s phenomena but it's early 80s phenomena so that's why those who were in england in the 90s like rimsen etc had a great impact of uh, uh, cookie and kia as an uh, uh, over, uh, overcoming of the minimalist this was actually kind of a uh, challenge towards minimalists 
conceptual art it rejected conceptual art it of course rejected the uh, the pure art argument of uh, greenberg uh, which had characterized the 60s and the 70s so the impersonality of uh, pop art also impersonality of um, uh, 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 sorry conceptual art and um, minimalist art uh, uh, minimal art you know yeah minimal abstraction especially uh, so th this art movement rejected the conceptual art reinforcing emotion now why do we so the question was actually if uh, pop art rejected emotion if uh, uh, um, um, concept art rejected uh, emotion or subjective expression that why should it be rejected counter question comes that reintroducing emotion is was the job of the trans avant-garde especially joy of being so the positive aspect about trans avant-garde is that it's very celebrative that it celebrates drawing painting and sculpture its artists revived figurative art and symbolism in a very spe special way the, way, the uh, from a different point of view the the uh, british figurative art was more objective more historical more responsible in terms of narrative figuration whereas the trans avant-garde italian is poetic they make references of this and that but experience itself is a kind of a uh, kind of a uh, uh, sorry so this movement became well known in art circles internationally and was appreciated for its bold decision to return to the roots that makes mysterious mystical art an appealing so a complete return to painting actually you find in uh, trans avant-garde italian after years of uh, two decades of conceptualism and minimalism you come to a kind of a uh, return back into a kind of a painting and uh, figurative painting that too Uh, uh they also use the aspect of abstraction so there is no division that bipolar division between figuration and abstraction is kind of cancelled by the trans avant-garde so uh, it also rediscovers the pleasure of painting art as an expressive instrument and language suffused with subjectivity of the artist so subjectivity of the artist is the most important aspect of uh, italian trans avant-garde uh no it rejects uh, linguistic darwinism i will explain what it means uh, in relation to the visual art and its displacement given birth to trans avant-garde uh, and its nomadic concern trans avant-garde talks about nomadic nomadic as a culture not as status quo culture but nomad would be have no stable uh, stable uh, uh, stay in one place so it he drifts or she drifts with no preconstituted directions they move as per their requirement no departures and no arrivals so unlike the darwin idea that everything is predetermined and the selection of the best what whatever is the catch um, uh, you know formulation of that survival of the fittest right so uh, 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 darwinism is about no uh, that you know so uh, there is no predetermined um, pattern as far as uh, no preconstituted directions no there is no departure no arrivals avant-garde art had believed um, uh, had believed in evolution this is one aspect that we had mentioned yesterday all the avant-garde artists come one after the other in response to the previous in response to the previous they supposed to be forward uh, progressing beyond you know the what whatever was achieved so trans avant-garde italian have do not accept the idea of evolution at all 
which is a Darwinist idea. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, they uh, advanced the idea of cultural nomadism, but not they did not propagate itself as a school or as a particular dogma, but it propagated it as a as a as a mentality, like hippie movement. You know, it's a kind of an institution without institution. It becomes a kind of more social in its orientation. Um, actually, Bonito Olivia, who is a spokesperson of Transavangar Italian, quotes, I quote here, progress in the art is about movement in more than one direction. For example, in historic avant-garde, futurism existed along with, alongside metaphysics with Bocchioni and Bella, cubism of Picasso and Braque, and also the mythical imagine, Im imagery of Di Crico, who gave us painting that appears to be classical, even though metaphysics was the matrix of surrealism. And so the evolution of the artists and the theories of art, not of materials, uh, materials and techniques. So uh, meaning that simultaneity of uh, existence, art styles. I mean, any idea that can give a uh, uh, thing that one has led to the other and, you know, that kind of unilinear progression of modernism is being challenged by trans avant Italian, uh, actually Bonito. They don't believe this, they believe in simultaneity of uh, languages. Now, another very important uh, focus of trans avant uh, Italian artist is the subjectivity. Now, the subjectivity of the modernist subjectivity was the one singular subject that is supposed to be kind of this idea of subject was already broken with the lives of ba Francis Bacon and um, our pop artist um, uh, Andy Warhol that they accepted publicly that they belonged to they, they, their subjectivities were not unified it had fragmentation in that so uh, the Italian in the 80s uh, Italian trans had Artists believe that the subjectivity is fragmented. It is not totalizing thing. It's not a private thing, you know, like the feminists would say. Or it is not sheerly autobiographical. It's not merely autobiographical. Uh, it is characterized by changeability, provisionality, contradiction, and love for detail. So. Mm, so that is an unabashed acceptance of non-linearity, non-unitariness of the self, also an outright celebration of hedonism. These are all things which you don't actually find in art because pleasure is something that is controlled in the society, right? that you are not even supposed to drink in front of others. There's always that hierarchy. You know, there is a whole lot of uh, secrecy about pleasure, pleasure making. Uh, that's why sex is a total, you know, uh, closed door affair, as far as human being is concerned, whereas for animals it's in public, right? So that is also you make the distinction between animal and the human being. But uh, according to Rans Avangard, pleasure is a, of a, a belief in pleasure, belief in pleasure. Uh, minority in reality mainly because it um, uh, depends on the individual drive of the personal image. So uh, they celebrate the aspect of pleasurability of life, uh, pleasurability of life. I think it is a very good dose to the conventional Malayali uh, culture. <laughs> I mean, we are very, very tight with, when it comes to social morals and, you know, pleasure is a very secret uh, thing. Change, uh, change. So, uh, there is no sense of uh, constantness about it. Or there is no stability as far as uh, uh, they use uh, different languages in abandon. Post provisionality is one aspect of it. There is all, everything is ephemeral and for the time being, 
are, or what they defined as art is all constantly in transit. Art is always changing. So it's another word. It is also similar to the flux. The flux, this movement uh, idea. Images are as leading to sensation. Uh, images, visual images as communicating sensation. Uh, time as flex, not to get closed into consistency. Uh, one should not be get uh, uh, bothered about consistency. One should not think in terms of consistency or, or, or in a fixed ideology or belief. So it could be actually taken as a postmodern mindlessness of celebrity anything. But it is the maximum theorization that is possible as far as Tan Savangad is concerned, you know. It is also a resistance against the kind of uh, social uh, hypocrisy or fixation and, you know, kind of things that... Uh, uh, so images as symptoms that manifest in, front, in the artist as, a, as a, an inhost, inexhaustible uh, storehouse. Now, I quote again uh, uh, Olivia, actually, Bonito Olivia, here, uh, the quote is, the view mentality of art consists in its consciousness of its own centrality, of its self-sufficiency in the world which no longer for and no longer finds fixed places to anchor or rip and repair. Art has become the last frontier, the territorial limits of its own movement. Like Nietzsche's tightrope walker Zarathustra, he is balancing on the high wire. The artist of the new generation walks completely enwrapped in his own lightness with no fear of falling. Free from any horror of earth which he could end up crashing down upon. Because there is no hierarchy of heaven and earth, no difference between high and low, the purveyors and the limited bastions of ideology and every other dogma has fallen. It's almost very, uh, you know, um, like uh, pronouncing the future uh, of uh, some examples of, uh, uh, I'm not going into explain all these uh, paintings, but just for your visual uh, reference I am just showing. This is Androkia Road. It uh, very definitely kind of uh, celebrates the, you know, or pain or suffering, you can say. Uh, here there is a communion between uh, a natural force as well as human being. Uh, this is Fra Francisco Clemente. Clemente again doesn't actually focus on a particular style. He works in various styles. Our Bhupan Kakkar also is quite influenced by Clemente. Uh, Clemente is the most, uh, you know, what do you call a very um, uh, colorful artist, very flamboyant artist, you know, um, of. Uh, um, you can also see this kind of imagery. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably he takes it from our uh, mm, tradition, like Brahma, uh, you know, ne Vishnu's navel giving rise to a f lotus flower, etc. So from there it comes back to us. Uh, this is uh, again Clemente, but there is no stylistic continuity. He's an art historian. If any art historian tries to uh, make a <laughs> chronology in a kind of an order, it is uh, so. It is actually madness. I mean, if uh, Kavita is showing this, I very well uh, accept that it's schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia made as a possibility. Schizophrenia is to be not to be treated in that sense by psychiatrists as a disease, but to be used by an artist in an effective way for expressing one's uh, truth or one's reality. So this is also Clemente. So I'm showing you some three or four ways. I mean, this is his uh, uh, collaborative work in Pondicherry. Uh, no, in South India, he has actually got it uh, painted by the 
South Indian painters. So appropriation, I don't know how you have gone uh, about the payment and stuff like that, the politics of it, I don't know. Uh, but this is Cookie, uh, our own artists, uh, many artists are, can be related, Kerala artists can be related to this, especially in the use of certain imagery uh, like the fish and the boat and the, you know, kind of metaphorical uh, use of uh, imagery is very significant as far as contemporary Kerala artists like an Aji is one artist, I remember. Uh, many other artists, definitely. So they all could be related to uh, trans avant Italian in terms of a kind of shared iconography or shared, uh, you know. Um, this is uh, Palladino. Di, Di Maria. So sometimes it's also difficult to differentiate the artist in trans avant because they all kind of work in it. So it's a night, you have to just enjoy the kind of color and the simplicity of the form and the, this thing. Um, this is Ticola di Maria again. Abstraction used, it's more gestural and um, uh, may not really mean anything in specific. <laughs> I will just go through this, uh, some examples of Cha Nam Jun Paik and um, I'm not going to kind of present you in any detail, but without touching them, somehow we are not uh, doing justice. So Nam Jun Paik is, uh, is an artist who has used to multiple this new media in a big way. He's a kind of an originator of uh, so it is kind of called as uh, electronic superhighway. Neon outline wall of televisions that forms a map electronic superhighway. Continental US, Alaska, Hawaii. It is exhibited at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So this is one. Then there are all kinds of uses of uh, new media in his uh, art. The, Mm, uh, tele, 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 television projections uh, or like a robot here. Uh, TV Buddha, there is a series called TV Buddha. I'm not going into that because that is actually to do also with the new, new technology. I think we will have some discussion on 9th or so when we have that book release when we have here. The thematic that is um, uh, this decided is that. But I'm interested uh, in the Yoko Ono uh, uh, earlier uh, feminist uh, social artist, political, political social artist uh, whose uh, conceptual performer, his her performer, performance is uh, cut piece. You know, his title. Uh, it was first performed in 1964 in uh, Tokyo, in a center for art at uh, Songhezu. And it had one simple but destructive verb at its uh, cut. Cut is the word that was used in this. Cut piece is a full title. Uh, it's a performance. Ono executed the performance by walking to the center of the stage. Uh, in her best uh, uh, garments and inviting the audience to cut off her clothing. So audience coming and cutting the clothing, casually sitting on the floor legs tucked underneath and audience uh, members would begin. Uh, so it was kind of an uh, art performance, uh, making a statement about women's uh, vulnerability in the so she, she's also an artist uh, who pushes the boundaries of art, film, music, theater, media, poster, so war is over, or even cartoon, you know. So uh, Yoko Ono plays a very important role. I'm just showing one example. That is all uh, I can do. Uh, just to kind of, these last few slides were just to kind of suggest uh, that many other mediums are used, like the electronic media, from cinema 
through video, through photography, through um, internet. Today's art is multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary, and uh, very, very challenging. We have actually India also we have this uh, collectives, art collectives, Srishti, uh, Srishti and AUD to a certain extent also teaches them these uh, new media art, uh, Srishti in Bangalore and AUD in Delhi uh, also teaches them. Uh, we have also collectives like the mm, mm, Rux Media Collective and other such, uh, you know. And individual artists uh, like Nalini Malani has a lot of video art and very many other artists. So we are abreast with the world. So it is in this way that uh, art has moved away from the object making, object, you know, orientation of art. Now, I want to end the series uh, three lectures by saying that all these are step forward or act, uh, actions to solve certain issues. But it doesn't mean that the issues are sorted or finally uh, no, sorted completely. Everything gets appropriated by the market. Even a so-called uh, uh, because the presence of the of the of the corporate, you can't actually exist without corporate funding, right? You need to have some funding agency like Smithsonian or any other agency uh, to to. So you are you have no escape from the big money or the sponsorship that you need to uh, bring in in the creation. So, I mean, limits of modern art, why I has brought out is also, why I have titled this presentation is also because of this absolute, uh, you know, uh, getting caught up in, a, in our own systems. And each time the artist tries to kind of uh, get over something, it again gets into some other kind of uh, 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 such entanglements as sponsorship as today or residencies, you know, where does all this money come from for residencies? So there's no going back of uh, in terms of capital as far as art making is concerned. So that is the my one explanation for the title, limitation, Limits of Modern Art. Um, uh, thank you so much for today's uh, patience. And uh, <clears throat> any question, if you have time, we can take quickly. It's 11.30. Now, coming two lectures are going to be uh, on modern, contempt, modern 20th, 19th and 20th century Indian art. And that will be done in one day. That is tomorrow morning as well as evening, afternoon. And there is one session probably scheduled day after tomorrow. Doubt 
ക്ലാരിഫിക്കേഷൻ വേണ്ടി വേറൊരു കാര്യം ചോദിക്കാൻ വേണ്ടി ജോസഫ് ബയസിൻ്റെ കാര്യം പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ ആ കയോട്ടെ എൻ്റെ കൂടെ അദ്ദേഹം ജീവിക്കുന്ന ഐ ലൈക്ക് അമേരിക്ക അമേരിക്ക ലവ്സ് മീ ആ വർക്കിൽ റീഗൻ്റെ റഷ്യയും അതിൻ്റെ പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ കോൺഫ്ലിക്റ്റുമായിട്ടാണോ ഈ ഒരു വൈൽഡ് അമേരിക്ക എന്നുള്ള രീതിയിൽ മാഷ് പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ അങ്ങനെ എനിക്ക് തോന്നിയ പക്ഷെ ഞാൻ അവിടെ വായിച്ച പോലെ തോന്നുന്നു ഈ കൊയട്ട എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഈ റെഡ് ഇന്ത്യൻസിൻ്റെ ഒരു മിത്തിക് മീൻസ് അമേരിക്ക സോ കോൾ യു എസ് എ വൈപ്പോട്ട് ചെയ്ത ആദിമ അമേരിക്കൻ വംശകരുടെ ഒരു മിത്തിക്കൽ എലമെൻറ്റ് പിന്നെ ആനിമൽ പോലെയും അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അവരുടെ ഒരു റോ ആയിട്ടുള്ള അവരുടെ ജീവിത രീതിയിൽ അതൊരു അങ്ങനെ അതിനൊരു മെറ്റഫറിക്കൽ വാല്യൂ കൂടി ഉണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളൊരു സാധനം ഞാൻ എവിടെ ഡയറക്റ്റ് എക്സ്പ്ലനേഷൻ സോ ഐ എം ജസ്റ്റ് റീഡിംഗ് ഇറ്റ് ഫ്രം ദി ടൈറ്റിൽ ഫ്രം ദി വേ ടോട്ടൽ പെർഫോമൻസ് വസ് ദൻ ദാറ്റ് വൈ ഷുഡൻറ്റ് യു സ്റ്റെപ്പ് ഓൺ ടു അമേരിക്കൻ സോയിൽ സോ ദർ ഇസ് എ സെർട്ടൻ um historical uh, disagreement that is making with america so whether it is with particular regime and its involvement or its general uh, you know american history as you say about red indians and you know how the whites have uh, completely wiped up, wiped away that culture right uh that is more a matter of interpretation that can vary definitely it can be seen from that perspective or this pers perspective as far as he is not saying that my performance is an illustration of that it is more metaphoric of uh, how you can tame or how you can befriend something that is so wild you know so his own attempt perhaps is to tame american policies or american this thing so in a way it is kind of his will to deal with it yeah i think this is how i will see it uh, because he is not saying anything is symbolic here you know because he plays like a poet poets words and you know phrases will actually would exist in a kind of a imagination no it will enable in a imagination rather than description then it metaphoric so it is poetic and it is uh, uh, evocative at least it helps us to think about history and the contemporary politics right and uh, it is possible to read it in various ways that we like so no i mean it reminds me of this particular movie by that uh, life of pi i mean i am sure actually if sometimes i want to ask that writer or the director are you influenced by this particular performance <laughs> you know there is that whole sequence about that boy and that uh, tiger in that you know this thing how they negotiate you know the space how they negotiate now i'm just this is just uh, now does it have a political significance i don't know but this is definitely about human survival and human you know assertion of the creativity of our faculty human creativity uh, so it is it, it was brought out in a very po- po- very very vocative way uh, especially also after that end you know that the, the tiger walks into the general without even looking back once so all that take over taming the wild and all that you know struggle that you do at the end still the wild is wild you have to accept right yeah. sir uh, any yan and critic critic in the sense eniki mottham nammude 
ആർട്ട് പ്രാക്ടീസസിലും ഈ ആർട്ട് പെഡഗോഗി പ്രാക്ടീസസിലും കലാ വിദ്യാഭ്യാസത്തിൻ്റെ ഈ ഈ ഈ ഒരു മെത്തഡോളജിയിലും നല്ല സംശയമുണ്ട് ഏത് മെത്തഡോളജി സാർ അടക്കമുള്ള പെഡഗോഗ്സിൻ്റെ മീൻസ് ഞാൻ അടക്കമുണ്ട് അല്ല അതാണ് അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഞാൻ ചോദിച്ചത് അത് എൻ്റെ ഡൗട്ടാണ് മീൻസ് സെൽഫ് ക്രിറ്റിക്കലും കൂടിയാണ് പക്ഷേ എന്തുകൊണ്ടെന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ശരിയാണ് നമുക്ക് ഒരു ടെക്സ്റ്റ് വായിക്കാതെ അതിനോട് ക്രിറ്റിക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ നിവർത്തിയില്ല എന്നുള്ളത് കൊണ്ട് സാറിത് പിന്നെ പൊസിഷൻ എടുക്കാതെ ഇതൊക്കെ അവതരിപ്പിച്ചു എന്നിട്ട് അതിൻ്റെ ക്രിറ്റിക്കിനെ കുറിച്ച് പറയുകയും ചെയ്തു പക്ഷേ വീണ്ടും വീണ്ടും ആവർത്തിക്കുന്ന ഒരു ഗ്രാൻഡ് നാറേഷനിൽ ചില സേട്ടൺ ഹിസ്റ്ററി മാത്രം എപ്പോഴും പ്രിഡോമിനൻ്റായിട്ട് ഇങ്ങനെ വന്നുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുകയും അത് മാത്രം അത് നമ്മൾ അറിഞ്ഞോ അറിയാതെയോ മഗ്ഗുകയും അത് ട്രാൻസ്മിറ്റ് ചെയ്യുകയും ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് വളരെ ബോധപൂർവ്വം നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും അറിയുകയും ചെയ്യാം അതിൽ അത്രയും തന്നെ എന്താ പറയുക അത്ര പ്രശ്നം ഉണ്ട് അതിൽ ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ഈ നമ്മളുടെ കോൺഷ്യസ്നെസ് ബിൽഡ് ചെയ്യുന്നതായിട്ടും നമ്മൾ കൺസ്ട്രക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്ന ഈ നോഷൻസ് മൊത്തം ബിൽഡ് ചെയ്യുന്നതിൽ ഇത്തരം സാ ഇതിൻ്റെ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ട് എന്താണെന്ന് നല്ല ബോധ്യമുള്ളപ്പോഴും നമ്മൾ വീണ്ടും ഏതൊക്കെയോ കൊളോണിയൽ പാസിൻ്റെ പ്രേതം പേറിയിട്ട് ഇപ്പോഴും ഈ സാധനം വളരെ ശക്തമായി പ്രാക്ടീസ് ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് അത് ഒരു ഒരു കാര്യം കൂടി ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞിട്ട് നിർത്താം എന്ന് വെച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ എന്ത് സംഭവിക്കുന്നതെന്ന് വെച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ പിന്നെ ട്രാൻസവാൻ കാർഡും പിന്നെ അതല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇവരെല്ലാവരും അത് പിന്നെ സൈമൽട്ടേനിയസ്ലി ആണ് പക്ഷെ അവർക്ക് അതിന് നോംസ് ഇല്ല മീൻസ് അവർക്ക് അതിന് മുകളിൽ സുപ്പീരിയേഴ്സ് ഇല്ല നമ്മളുടെ അവസ്ഥ എന്താണെന്ന് വെച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഇതെല്ലാം കടം കൊണ്ടിട്ടുള്ളത് കൊണ്ട് ഇവിടുത്തെ പ്രാക്ടീസിന പ്രാക്ടീസിന് ലൈഫിന് നമുക്ക് അഡ്രസ്സ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുന്നില്ല എന്നുള്ള ബേസിക് ലൈഫിന് നമുക്ക് കടം കൊണ്ട പിന്നെ മെത്തഡോളജീസും ഡിവൈസസും കൊണ്ട് മാത്രമേ ജസ്റ്റിഫൈ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുള്ളൂ എന്നുള്ള ഇൻ്റലക്ച്വൽ ഗതികേടിലാണ് നമ്മൾ ജീവിക്കുന്നത് സോ സോറി സോ സോറി സോ സോറി ആക്ച്വലി ദാറ്റ് ഇഫ് യു ആക്ച്വലി റീഡ് ഇറ്റ് ആസ് എ ഗതികേട് നോ അല്ല ആദ്യത്തെ ആദ്യം പറഞ്ഞത് എന്താണെന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ ദർ ഈസ് എ കാനൺ ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് വാട്ട് യു ആർ റെഫറിംഗ് ടു ഇൻ യു ടോ സ്റ്റഡിങ് മോഡേൺ ആർട്ട് ഓ പോസ്റ്റ് മോഡേൺ ആർട്ട് ഓ ഹിസ്റ്ററി ആ സച്ച് ഈസ് ഓൾവേസ് തിങ്കിങ് ഇൻ ടേംസ് ഓഫ് വാട്ട് ഈസ് മോർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് വാട്ട് ഈസ് ലെസ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ഹൗ ഡു യു പുട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഇൻ ആൻ ഓർഡർ ഓ ഹൗ ടു സി ഇറ്റ് സൈമൽട്ടേനിയസ്ലി ഓൾസോ യു ആർ ടു സേ സംതിങ് ഫസ്റ്റ് റൈറ്റ് റൈറ്റ് so that actually is challenged by the elites by feminists by lgbtq people we call this mainstream canon as patriarchal i mean you just need to read somebody like uh, griselda pollock and the whole uh, patriarchal um, you know mm, this thing about avant-garde construction. Now, there is actually a heavy weight that is on an art historian. I mean, the day I have entered the uh, Department of Art History, I have learnt that, 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 that uh, as a curriculum, right? Now, I am also in the process of making a curriculum when I am actually presenting postmodern art in a particular way, right? but best part of education is that we can always step outside that we can always critique that we are not taking it as i am not at least presenting it as a absolute canon i mean there is a different slight difference only we are making but uh tell me i don't know still still i don't know i'm grappling with this i'm waiting for parun to ask me because uh i have reviewed that book latest book edited by parthamitra uh, uh one of the points that i am actually saying is that in my review is that it is following the very same structure you know of colonial period revivalism of it, progressive baroda all those regional everything now they are actually trying to diversify it more 
add more themes into it, you know, design in uh, uh, Chandini Ketan. Women artists in modern India, or contemporary India, things like that. You no know, Dalit artists in contemporary India. So there are always addi addi uh, additions are being done into that main narrative. Main narrative remains the same. Now, which other way we should do it? I mean, I don't know. Still, I don't know. But I find that it is problem. If there is a problem. But what is the counter alternative structure that I want to present to you or discuss? I do not know. Despite the fact that I have pointed out Griselda Pollock writing feminist critique, or oh, there is a Dalit critique of the mainstream Indian art history, do we know how to do it otherwise? Have any Dalit art historians or feminist art historians uh, uh, tried to write uh, another history? Yeah, so probably you have to give more time. You have to give more time, but I don't know. So I cannot answer that question. You can only do one thing when you are giving a, you know, uh, uh, this thing, um, canon. You can only say that. Uh, it can be critiqued, it can be looked at with the limit, as a limitation. I mean, that's my only strategy was using that. Limits of modern art was my strategy to challenge the uh, canon. I don't know whether it answers. <laughs> No, the thing is that your second question was more important, I feel. Now I feel. See, we are still a, a, a post-colonial country. You know, we have had 200 years of uh, European rule. We have learned many things to, from that. Everything was a challenge. Right for us, even speaking English was a challenge for us. Learning world art or art history was a challenge to us, right? So, Ravindra Tagore had to bring one teacher from abroad, still like Cambridge, to teach uh, Western art, Western art, modern Western art in Chandrigarh, right? Now, it may happen that it becomes a kind of weight over us. Sometimes, or most of the time, or almost. But it is also a historical fact that we have mastered this master's language. I mean, that is why we have writers in English, Indian writers in, in English in, in a foreign language, and achieving great heights, Western recognition. Isn't it? Don't you agree? No, West or oh, America will always think that they are the center of the world. Like Hollywood is Hollywood and we are not imitating Hollywood in any of our regional art of cinema. We may say that there are certain reflection of that, but our regional cinema or our Hindi cinema, I mean, I mean, include Hindi cinema also as a regional cinema. You know? Uh, uh, it has its own kind of characteristics. Its own kind of, it's an industry by itself. It's, it's its own norms. Good or bad, I don't know. I don't think that the na na national uh, uh, negativities are okay. I don't think so. We are also critique of that, right? So it's not so much actually uh, Western hegemony and Western weight on us. It's also a 
Indian hegemony that is suppressing us. I will bring in that dimension also into it. Because we have, in the historical process, has somehow come out of that westernization, western dominance, cultural dominance. Largely, we, we are open. Like Tagore said that I want to keep all my windows open so that wind from all over the, from all over the world comes into my house. But I will not allow my house to be uh, shattered by that wind. This is one famous quotation by Tagore. I think that's the spirit, no? We study, we go abroad, we walk in, we should have knowledge about things. We take what we want. I mean, this is a kind of a, we are no more imitators of the Western art. I mean, that stage has been long back been overcome. I mean, I will elaborate that more when I present my Indian uh, part in it, because we cannot start talking about Indian art without referring to the West. West need not talk about East, you know, when they talk about their art. But we have to, and we have to deal with it. So Indian artists definitely have dealt with it. That's what I feel. So I don't know whether you have to feel that burden still. Confidence. There are so many because the Dalit uh, people and all the other, you know, the kind of otherized people, they are still, you know, struggling with their opportunities to get equal opportunity for education Dalit. and all stuff. And how can we? So that. So that is what I'm saying. Actually, uh, that is what I meant by class ridden. India's class riddenness is acceptable to us? No. India's discriminations are acceptable to us? No. So that is another level of uh, discourse, right? I mean, it's not by legitim it is not to legitimize that India is even and equal and democratic, right? Especially in the current regime, it is going from bad to worse. So how to resist all that is a question. So uh, Dalit is in the frame. Dalit voices are being heard. LGBTQ word, uh, voices are being heard. So we are actually not in 70s. We are still moving ahead, you know, in terms of incorporating, we have our own challenges. We know where to stand with, whom to stand with when it comes to power, you know. So I answered that question only from the perspective of that India as a monolith and India as our position. Yeah. Sir, uh, first of all, I appreciate your lecture. It was very inspiring, motivational in all senses. Uh, here I would like to uh, ask you one aspect that uh, one student, he may have uh, come across a situation where he or she start with art history. Uh, sorry, what was that word? May come across with? He or she may come across art history from prehistoric to contemporary. So you, uh, we know that after uh, uh, Greek or Roman Renaissance, uh, Romanticism, uh, Impressionism, uh, Cubism, blah, blah, blah. So uh, it's all followed by 1960s uh, new media art. So uh, we know that institutions like us never uh, insist any uh, students uh, to follow any particular uh, movement, but uh, it is always, as we know, that uh, 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 student uh, they incorporate or internalize uh, uh, their uh, uh, their own languages according to their choices and depends upon their imagination and pictorial needs. Okay, so uh, the hype is that if he is or she is compelled to adopt the language of uh, 1960s, this uh, new media art, uh, as he thinks that it is a kind of 
a kind of state of art technology uh, rather than uh, critically evaluating the contest because uh, it's already 1960 in the sense it's around uh, 60 years is over but still we consider this uh, uh, new media art as a kind of uh, uh, latest uh, venture so, so what's your opinion question is that uh, your question is about art education right so in art education we understand that we are liberal we are democratic right we should be practicing greater uh, flexibility with regard to curriculum that's my belief that art students should be having inputs in terms of sociology history anthropology they should have general understanding of various humanities disciplines not just art history if we can offer courses and options could be made like in the american system i'm not saying american system is great but at least electives or options should be available for ba and ma students even for phd students so that they can choose to if there is a ba student who wants to do study dalit issues or feminist issues where is a scope in an art school you don't have any scope you simply call it art history from greek to renaissance to contemporary who who whose fault is it who is making this curriculum change the curriculum there is no compulsory ness that only art history should be taught in an art school this is actually in the 40s belief 50s belief open them up to humanities various humanities teach them literature teach them psycho psychology teach them humanities at large you know that 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 is not being worked out thought about as far well as now second uh, reaction that i have is that uh, no teacher should compel a student to take this medium or that medium a teacher may do what he or she wants to do in the terms of their own art but whatever is prescribed to them in the syllabus like portrait study life study uh, sketching uh, painting the techniques that are available in a ba art uh, program should be taught right who says that uh, new media is a perfect option for anybody i don't think so i don't agree with that if somebody is saying that it may be latest but latest may not be the most applicable to me i may still want to paint in the miniature style that's my choice right but it is not to me it is not actually the problem of what media you should use new media or conventional media what you should paint or what you should make art about the concept of what art should be more stressed upon you see i have started an art school in ambedkar university there we made it uh, a poem not to have painting and sculpture and print making or applied arts we call it an art institution we art focused on developing of the concept of the student you can develop your media materials technique in whichever way you want there is no uh, compulsion that you should be be teach actually uh, new media that is because it's technology and it's a technical skill it's not because you have compelled to make me new media art right so uh, there is a lot of issues related to art education that we need to address uh, but I, at no point i don't think anybody should uh, push the students to do anything particular in terms of new media art or something because it is latest but it is up to the students to the to choose 
what they want to do in terms of technique, in terms of material and means. I think I have made it clear. Uh, yeah. So uh, by talking about new media art, I am not propagating new media art by no means. Uh, so that's not my intention, interest. I am interested in many other things in the classroom and also in my life, you know. So I share some of it with you, that's all. All right. So <laughs> thank you very much for that question. That uh, was provocative, so I gave a prov little provocative answer also, Mark. Uh, not personally criticizing anybody when we come to art college. That will happen more on 9th. There is a book release on art education. <laughs> and it is on new media art that they have decided, Lalit Kala has decided. So we can probably hear a lot of uh, conflicts there. In my personal opinion, I gathered from the students. So I'm going to ask you Yes, yeah, see, the thing is that if uh, the opinion is that theory is being imposed on the student, as far as AUD is concerned, if you are referring to AUD, yeah, we do believe that theory should be learned. <laughs> I may stand uh, criticized by generations for that, but we want students to read ideas because we live in a world which should make sense to you. I mean, you cannot be closed and say that I'm not concerned about the Dalit, I don't, I'm not concerned about LGBTQ. You may not be LGBTQ, but there is your brother who is uh, LGBTQ. Are you not concerned? So it is theory that can teach you about gender, about society, about history, about uh, many things, cultures, cultural studies, you know. So that is why theory is predominant there. We think that, you know, even if students don't do uh, two years work, it's okay. But it will be a lifetime earning if they gain something from the theory class. So they, we also don't want to teach Greek to Renaissance or Renaissance to contemporary. Like somebody used to say, Bimbeka to Bupen. In, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something like that. No. No, actually the orientation has changed. We are more uh, issue-based. Even this course that I have devised, this is more issue-based, not descriptive, right? So, yeah, so it is not actually media, anything, new media is being promoted, but maybe new media should know. Why shouldn't you know? It is up to you to use it or not. I mean, that's a technology that is handy, you know, like, it is helpful, very helpful to you. No internet, right? I mean, I will be at a loss when, if I'm not using any of these, WhatsApp or anything, I'll, I'll be in a less advantageous position. So I must know algorithms. I know what is uh, contemporary music, how sound art is made and, I'm very curious and I'm interested. That's all. I mean, and that's my personal position about it. Thank you very much again for very important questions uh, to be raised. I think we should have more such discussions um, of clarification or questions and in one session, whenever that is. I'm ready to kind of uh, address those.